baseball is dead. Rest in peace. It is Thursday, October 17th. It's a big anniversary. It is the 20 year anniversary of Dave Roberts stealing the base game four of the 2004 American League Championship Series, uh, which I was at with my dad. I would say the best game ever played at Fenway besides game six of the 1975 World Series, the Carlton Fisk home run game. Some would argue that that's the best game ever played at Fenway Park. I would say it's game four of the 2004 American League Championship Series. What a moment. What a moment just because everybody, the, the fucking popcorn vendor, the folks outside the ballpark, right? Everybody in the world, in the free universe, knew that Dave Roberts was stealing second base, mm-hmm. knew that that was the game plan. And I just like in a moment like that, to know what's going to happen, to anticipate, to expect what should happen. Everybody's like, well, this has got to happen. And it fucking happens. And it's just with with the guy on the mat, like just everything. It was just so. Oh, it's just like such a baseball moment. I uh, one of the one of the lost moments of the underdog dinger derby is I I think when I got in the box for the first time and Joe West was umpiring, I thanked him for getting the call right on that play because this is before replay. It was very, very close. Uh, I did an interview yesterday for a special that Nesson is doing on the 04 stuff. And I was like, I think the farther removed we are from 2004, the more that we just kind of like bundle it up and say, it's crazy. They came back from being down three games to nothing. But it was improbable thing after improbable thing after improbable thing that equated to the greatest comeback in sports history. Like Dave Roberts stealing second base in that game. It was such a bang bang play prior to replay that if Joe West called him out, like, of course, the crowd would boo because they want him to be safe. But it was so close that how could you blame him for it was a coin flip call. It was a coin flip call for Cowboy Joe. And he got it right to his credit. And there were so many close plays in that series. You had the um, Tony Clark with the the double down the line that skipped into the stands in game five that if it doesn't go foul or excuse me, if it doesn't go into the stands for a ground rule double, Ruben Sierra scores, Red Sox lose game five, they lose the series in five. Uh, the fact that they didn't bunt on Kurt Schilling in game six, like the dude had a tendon sutured to the bone in an experimental surgery the day of his fucking start and the Yankees didn't bunt on the guy. That was also the... The A-Rod slap, which they got that call correct. They were like, nope, you're out. Jeter back to first base. And also Mark Bellhorn hit a home run in that game that hit someone in the chest. The ball fell back in the field and it was originally called a double. The umpires got together and they're like, actually, that's a home run. Like they got all the calls. Like that never happens. (laughs) Pre-replay, it was kind of just like, we saw what we saw and go fuck yourself. Sorry. Like we, you know, we'd love to get it right, but we can't look at a replay or anything. So when you say it like that, does it make you think that maybe just maybe there was a higher level of attention to detail at that time because the replay crutch didn't exist because it feels like at certain times and I've watched plenty of these ball games where umpires are like, eh, safe and now he's out. It's the eighth inning. It's like, hold on. What can we go back and look at that? Cause it's not even close. Not even close. I don't know. And, and, I, I think it was also but think just about the, if, you're, the, if you're talking about improbability for all of those things to happen, that, that takes a lot of getting it correct. There's yeah. a lot of getting it right involved there. <laughs> and we see a lot of not getting it right initially the first time because of the replay crutch. That's so just uh, another perspective where we see shit go south a lot of the time and yeah. it's because there's the opportunity to come and clean it up. Well, that opportunity didn't exist. And so they got it right yeah. when they needed to. I think, I think it's also partly why I'm so whiny about this ALCS in particular is because I remember the magic of that ALCS, like the drama, the, uh, 
the anxiousness, the anxiety of watching these innings and the battles back and forth and the animosity and the lead changes uh, and like the drama of those plays being so close and it coming down to the umpires getting together and getting it right after the call on the field without the benefit of replay. And it's, you know, you can't hold up every LCS to literally the greatest LCS of all time. Like you're not going to do that. Um, But all that to say, like my main point was, I feel like the further we get from 04, the more that we just kind of bundle it up and say, oh yeah, that was the team that came back from being down 3-0. You got to unpack it. Like it was so much more than that. The Dave Roberts moment specifically and all the stuff that you talked about is the closest thing in my lifetime, baseball wise, to a Shakespearean play. Yeah, um, it, it was it, it is it is perfectly written and scripted and like it's not j- the Dave Roberts moment. It's it's also unique because in a lot of ways, the the emotional climax in in some ways was like the first thing that touched off the comeback. Right. So like you can yeah. say that the Red Sox winning the ALCS and then going on to win the World Series, the World Series is almost like a coda. To, to the to the play we're talking about here. It was like a foregone conclusion. Felt that way at the time. The epilogue. Played out. Totally. And but it's it is the back and forth that you're talking about and the chapters that you're talking about after Dave Roberts, that's as vividly as I remember anything. I was in college at the time. And I think it was a galvanizing force for people watching baseball in a way that I just wonder what what would bring about that today? Because at the time, not that not that you guys need this to be told, but like, but like the no, 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 no. Like the the Red Sox were the underdog unequivocally against the big bad Yankees. It wasn't two juggernauts facing off against each other. It wasn't the Red Sox of four championships facing off against the Yankees who haven't won since 09, but have, you know, all the championships previously. This was a classic underdog story after years of not being able to break through the heartbreak of 03 and to get the sequences that you got in 04 um i just uh i don't think we'll ever see anything that is as i'm not saying it was actually scripted but felt as if it was scripted for the most dramatic enjoyment possible um maybe ever again because 2016 like even with the cubs breaking their curse which was awesome in so many different unique ways was was not the same didn't have as many folds to it didn't have as many plot twists and really didn't have the moment that the dave to go back to the original point of this that the dave roberts steel represented um and it might that be that moment the best. was the other team like the the rajai davis home run right. was the holy fuck moment but it wasn't for the cubs right jason hayward's speech is almost held up as like you know, the galvanizing moment in that game for the Cubs, but nobody saw that. We didn't get to see that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So it's like, OK, that's not on the field in the same sort of way. So it's like it's not to take away from what the Cubs did, obviously. But the, I think the, the Dave Roberts thing is seared in my brain in a way that uh, an event for a team that I don't root for probably will never be again. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing with uh, that 04 run. Like, I remember October 17th, like it's my firstborn's birthday, (laughs) like like October 17th comes around. I'm like, yeah, that was game four of the 2004 ALCS. Like, I just boom. Um, When the Red Sox won in 04, October 27th, 1140 p.m. It's like, yeah, that's when my firstborn, like, I remember the time that the fucking final out was recorded. I always wondered what it would be like to have enough baseball under our belts to look back at an event that happened 20 years prior. And like what? Hey, you remember that thing that happened? That's 20 years ago now. I hate that. <laughs> I hate that so That's much. That's half my life. That's yeah. half my life. Ago. Yeah, that is which is uh, stunning because in a lot of ways it feels that long ago. And in other ways, like I can still picture where I was when the steel happened. I can still picture the steel and the, the atmosphere surrounding it. It's just that's the beauty of baseball, too, is it's. I can still hear it like I can still hear it. It's I remember all like all of it and the irony being that uh, uh, I have a picture with my dad 
me and my dad standing on the field pregame. This is when they used to do like the Red Sox fan photo and they'd have the photographers go around and take pictures and then they upload them to redsox.com. They give you a little card. You'd go on and buy it or whatever. Uh, so I have a picture before game four of the 2004 ALCS with my dad. The green monster is in the background, but like the picture is here. But what you can't see is just outside of it. Dave Roberts is playing catch behind us like he's warming up. So it, it was pretty fucking cool. Like I, I only have like a screenshot of that photo. Like I fucking wish like I don't know why we didn't buy it and print it out and keep it forever. Like I have a screenshot of it. So like I have the photo, but like it's not good quality at all. But like I know the story like I, I can look at that and be like, that's game four of the 2004 ALCS. Dave Roberts is literally warming up behind us right there, like as that picture is being taken. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I'm sure lots of baseball fans have memories that stand out. Like I know the date. I know the time. I know where I was. Maybe you were at the game. Maybe you were home watching it with people that you love. Uh yeah, I, I like Dallas. What's what's that game for you where you're just like, yep. I mean, obviously your perfect game, but like, Ed, did you have a, a, a game like that as a fan? Um, Honestly, like I, I, I go back like the 89 series, the 89 World Series were just such a um, like the the earthquake. Yeah, that was like a cultural like was, moment, not like a sports moment. I was I was I mean, I've, I've, I tell the story and Stu. Stu always makes fun of me now because he, he he's heard the story plenty of times. But I was behind, <clears throat> or I was in my bedroom at the time, and my mom is out in the living room, and she's watching the pregame festivities and you know the shit that's going to be going on or whatever. And uh, the fucking the plant behind our TV, I guess, like starts to shake a little, and so my mom starts yelling at me. She's like, hey, quit, quit fucking around. Get out from behind there. And I'm like, is she talking to me? So I like, I run out. I, I remember like fucking, I remember just like bebopping out into the fucking living room, like down the hallway. And, my, and I was like, mom. And she didn't say a fucking word. She grabbed me, picked me up. And we ran down the stairs, like out into the parking lot away from the building. And I'm like, what the fuck are we doing? Right. I'm like six, uh, six or seven. I have no idea what's going on. I've just been scooped up. I got yelled at. I'm, I got scooped up. We were supposed to watch the world series. Now we're not what's going on. That was, that was something that I was like, holy shit. Okay. Oh, okay. Now we're watching TV and we're seeing the bridge. We're seeing cars just off the bridge. I'm like, holy shit. Wrapping my head around. This is like a six, seven year old. Like that was, that was bananas. And obviously, I mean the, the Hatterberg, Patty hits 20 hand in the air. I mean, people like, like people have that image tattooed on their body, let alone tattooed in their mind. They have that image tattooed on their body. I, I you could go to a Oakland Coliseum. You can go to the Oakland A's game and there's probably no less than three and a half people that have that moment tattooed and commemorated on their body. Was that your first earthquake? Uh, my first one that I remember. Yeah, mm. for sure. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, I, there might have been more. I just like I, I have a I have a really good memory. I don't remember a lot from like when I was like maybe super young. That's probably like the beginning. You know, some would call that suppressive. Uh, so yeah. I think I, I was just like, like, damn, there's a lot. There's a lot going on here. It's a big game. I know it's the World Series. My mom's been pumping this up. It's the A's. It's the Giants. Like my dad had been talking about it. Everybody had been talking about it. And I just, I remember that. And, and then I remember the moment, obviously in our, in our community and everything that happened afterwards. And then that's why growing up and being able to then put a face to some of the names that I heard when I'm hearing about the work that Dave Stewart's doing in the community, like the guy's fucking helping people. It, he's in full uniform. Imagine encountering something like, a earthquake where you think your life and everything you know is literally crumbling around you and you need help and who do you look 
Who do you look to? You got fucking Dave Stewart in full Oakland Hayes uniform reaching out along with teammates helping people. Like that's the kind of shit that I grew up with. Those are the stories that I grew up with. So so sports moment, yes. Cultural moment, yes. That and then the iconic Hattie with the hand raised, man. Yeah. Do you have one, Jay? Like first iconic baseball memory? Yeah, just like a mm. like a, a a baseball, like a date that it just stands out. You're like, yep, I know when that game was. Um, you know that's a good question. I mean the the moment, yes, I I do. the The most impressionable moment that I have in all of my baseball watching was watching Cleveland lose Game Seven of the 1997 World Series. Mm. Um, not to everybody else had a nice moment um my my team has never won the <laughs> world series uh since i've been alive um so there are there are lots of memories that i have of things that are not the guardians or indians but uh i was 12 years old at the time um and i remember i was watching the game by myself uh cuz i couldn't handle watching it around anybody else uh and i was a totally different type of fan at that time obviously and uh i just remember uh, the game being blown, uh, obviously, uh, in the fashion that it was and, uh, just crying and crying myself to sleep and then waking up the next morning and watching, uh, you know, the rerun of baseball tonight, as a matter of fact, and which I did every morning before I went to school, uh, and, uh, wishing that the outcome, uh, had been different, but that was, that was the last time I cried over baseball. Um, and that's the most that's the most memorable moment that I have uh, in terms of like, I can, I, I, I've lived in eight places since I lived in that house or something like that. And I can still put myself right back in that bedroom as a 12 year old, where I was, how everything was oriented. Uh, and obviously I wish it was associated with a positive outcome instead of a negative one, but that's, that's how baseball rolls. So the, this is your, the Jay Hay villain origin story is the yeah. 1997 world series game seven. Oh, like no you, question. You were just never the same after that. You're just a different I, guy. I was never the same. Uh, Cleveland obviously did not make the World Series with that era of team uh, ever again after 97. And, uh, you know, what you saw five or six years after that was what I would get used to for the rest of my baseball fandom, which was uh, a selling off of all the good players um, once mm. a certain period of time had expired. And, you know, it's never not to be overly dramatic, but it has never been the same for that team. All, all Cleveland fans know that uh, since that late 90s, early 00s kind of pivot. And uh, yes, 20, there were different times that hurt very badly as well. I remember where I was uh, when Cleveland proceeded to puke all over themselves in 2007 against the Red Sox in the ALCS. Mm. Uh, I was at a wedding in the greater Massachusetts, Boston area with a lot of Red Sox fans. Both my brother and I were in attendance. So we had to watch Cleveland get uh, get embarrassed. Uh, Fausto Carmona, uh, Roberto Hernandez, the uh, in front of and with Red Sox relatives. So that was uh, really unfortunate and painful. And 2016 was hurtful in its own way, but uh, you know that was less to do about the baseball and more to do about you know. Um, the opportunity for my my grandparents to see you know one more championship and that kind of fading away but uh 1997 for me was its own animal and will never ever be replicated for me well october is when baseball legends like edgar renteria are made <laughs> wow just absolutely no class <laughs> begin wow. your road to greatness on underdog where you can make picks on all your favorite players' stats, all you have to do is choose higher or lower on things like strikeouts, total bases, and home runs. You could win up to 1,000 times your money playing their pick'em game. Sign up for Underdog using promo code Jared, that's J-A-R-E-D, and you'll get a free pick as part of your first cash entry, plus up to $1,000 in bonus cash when you deposit. Again, that's promo code Jared. Uh, J-A-R-E-D, cash in on every home run during the playoffs with Underdog. Uh, isn't it ironic almost that Edgar Renteria just has a different kind of connotation between our sports fandoms? Like he crushed your soul 
in the 1997 World Series, but he was the final out of the 2004 World Series before signing with the Red Sox that offseason. Um, but he was the final out. You said that was it. You said interesting was the word. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I did. I say it. I think I said it was ironic. Ironic. It's something for sure. <laughs> it's um, something. Yeah. Painful. I remember Renteria's stint in Boston, too. Not, yeah, he was terrible. Not very good. No, 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 no. no. I San think, Francisco giant legend, Edgar Renteria? Was he uh, the World Series MVP in 2010, or was that Juan Uribe? Um, I think it was I Renteria. It was him. I believe it was him, because Freddie Sanchez won the fucking batting title that year, too, I think. No, Freddie Sanchez won the batting title in like 2003 with the Pirates. Is are you sure it wasn't with the it was with the pirate was it the year before he went to San Francisco? Jay, hey, look that up. Freddie Sanchez batting title. Or am I thinking rookie of the year? I think I'm, I'm thinking pre- Dude, I'm pretty sure he won the fucking batting title. Freddie Sanchez uh won the NL batting title in two thousand and six. Six with the pirates? With, with the, the pirates. pirates. What did he do in two thousand three? Hit three forty four. Two thousand three, he hit two thirty five across thirty four plate appearances. With the Pirates? With the Red Sox. Ah. Uh, he came up with the Red Sox in 02, 03, got basically no playing time at all. Did we trade him for Jeff Supon? You traded him for, uh, with Mike Gonzalez for Brandon Lyon, Anastasio Martinez, and Jeff Supon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fucking Jeff Supon, man. That's another Brandon Lyon guy. was like a thing, too. Like, at least was Brandon like Lyon in the Kurt Schilling deal? Brandon Lyon. Brandon Lyon was, with Casey Fossum. He was with Mike Goss, Casey Fossum, and Jorge De La Rosa mm-hmm. for Kurt Schilling. Yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> yeah, I think it's just an age thing. Cause like I can recall this shit. And then the way that I just like don't remember trades that happened three years ago, like Milky will just dial it up and be like, oh yeah, like, you know, <laughs> fucking. Armando Benitez and this guy, like, like that was in the, you know, fucking whatever deal. I'm like, I don't remember. I don't even remember these players' names, but like, I can recall Brandon Lyon being in a trade for Kurt Schilling 21 years ago. I, I, I feel like now that we do baseball content like three times a week and it's been this way for a couple of years, I you actually feel like not like I'm not personally overloaded, but I feel like when I try to recall like when we have like, oh, what was the 2022 NLDS matchup between? It's like, I can do that for, as you're saying, for the, for the period of time that you're talking about. Right. But for those, I often have to go back and be like, oh, I remember lots of things about that series now that I'm looking at it. But like, it, well, and, it does seem to and, blend together and, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, and when you guys, when you guys start talking about certain things too, like I, I, I go back and I'm thinking to myself. You were playing, dude. You weren't fucking looking shit up on the internet. Like you weren't. What are you like? Why are why are you fucking going through the Rolodex? You you don't have the Rolodex. You were a player. You were a part of it. Yeah. That is interesting. Uh, Anyways, um, there were what? Two games played since our last podcast. Yes, sir. Two. Game all, three, all two game two, game two of the ALCS and game three of the NLCS were played since our last podcast recording. Uh, Justin Havens, I'm going to let you choose which series we dive into first. Uh, I'd rather do the most recent one. Um, the NLCS. Yeah, given that it, it's fresh exactly. in everybody's mind and fresh in my mind. And, you know, we can delay talking about the Guardians loss for, you know, another 10 minutes or so. But sure. yeah, I choose the Dodgers Mets. OK. Uh in this particular instance, um, the last, what, three Dodger playoff wins have been shutouts, and any time that they allow a run, they lose? Is that a thing? Basically. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's certainly one way to craft it. Yeah, that's... That's an interesting way to look at it. So the, 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 news, se- the news here is Shohei Otani also getting hits without somebody standing on second or third base. 0 for 22. That's crazy. With the bases empty. And what's the updated with runners in scoring position? I think it's seven for nine, right? Seven for nine. Yeah, but then there was nine. something crazy with like just runners on. Six runners was like 16 oh, no, for I'll, 18 I'll or something up, like that. Crazy. Just absolutely yeah, it, it's, batshit crazy statistics with Shohei Otani going on. Um, yeah, with with. with Guys on base, very different. 
Yes. I think for me, the read on this is, yes, the Dodgers kicked the Mets' ass at home again, and Otani hit a moon bomb. But after watching game two of the series, it's like, okay, uh, they got punched in the mouth in game one, and then they punched back in game two. Then they got punched in the mouth again. Like at no point, like I, I think if you if you look at games one and three in a vacuum, you're like, this is a pretty lopsided series. I mean, they are kicking the shit out of the Mets in this one. But it's like, all right, until they don't return serve in game four, that's when we have a different discussion. But I, nothing, nothing here is telling me. I know in the games that the Dodgers have won, they've won convincingly. But until the Mets fail to return serve here. I'm just going to assume that it's going to be a back and forth series, and I have no reason to believe otherwise. I, I mean, go ahead, Dallas. Fair assumption. Well, no, I was just going to say fair assumption. I just think that what we have seen from the Dodgers is it shows you that when they start to get on that run or when they start to click, when they start to get in a position where they're able to put at bats together, that's a daunting. That's a daunting task because you got guys like Kike showing up. What's he done? Fifteen Little homers poppy? now in the postseason. I mean, are you fucking serious? Mm-hmm. Like that's that's the kind of stuff that starts to creep up on you. Like you get punched in the mouth and you're going, shit, it's one nothing. How how'd that happen? Oh, it was an Otani bomb. It wasn't the Otani bomb. It was it was Kike. And we still gotta deal with Otani. And you you can see them like like having to make the decisions that they have to make so quickly, right? You, you, okay, you've walked Shohei and you've walked Mookie. And you are now in a spot where you're like, well, this is a fucking two run minimum inning here based on the at bats we have coming up. Cause one of these guys is going to be knocked in via knock. And then it's going to be a productive out that follows that. And now it's fucking two nothing. And, and that's, I think that's what this lineup starts to show you. Um, and, and as far as the Mets go, I think at times that has been a problem for them is, is building those innings. But we've seen that. We've seen it early. And if you start to get guys like Vientos, who we highlighted, then then I think you start to find yourself in that spot where you're at, Jared, where you say, I know what the Dodgers are capable of. I know what I've seen from this Mets offense in a small burst. I, I just I can't count that burst out and I can't rely on the Dodgers offense to bludgeon it because it it didn't happen in game two. No, I, I'm completely fine with Jared taking the position that uh, until a counterpunch is not delivered, then you can assume that it's going to be that way. I think that's I think that's fine. I, I do think I, I do think that underplays a little bit. And I, I get it. The w- a win is a win. Doesn't matter the margin. But we're now talking about a situation where the Dodgers have three shutout wins by eight or uh, eight nothing or greater in a single postseason. They're the first team to ever do that. Um, and they have four shutouts in their last five games. And the only other team to ever do that uh, or the most recent team to ever do that um, was the uh, there's only two other teams, the 2020 Braves and the 1905 Giants. So the it doesn't feel like a traditional level of dominance, I think, because two of the I, I believe two of those shutouts have been delivered largely by the bullpen um, or at least more than half the game. It was pitched by the bullpen in those games. So it's not like, you know, when the White Sox in 05 we're running out cons- complete game after complete game from their starting rotation. That feels a little different. But I do think, to your point about not, not necessarily having a huge takeaway from last night, my takeaway is that I'm viewing Walker Bueller as maybe a little bit more of a weapon coming out of yeah. game three than I did going into game three because I, you know, I, I spit a lot of stats and you know, made a few comments about how Bueller you know, really has spent basically the whole season looking not very good. Um, he had allowed more hits than innings pitched in every single month uh, that he pitched this season. Um, and last night, w- albeit in only four innings, and it took him 90 pitches to do it, which is obviously a, a a little bit of a grindy mix. It was four scoreless, and it was more it was more swings and misses than he's generated all season. So um, that even if it's viewed in four inning bursts. That to me is a weapon that I'm not sure I viewed in the in the Dodgers quiver before game three. So that uh, he probably only has one more shot in this series to make an impact. But I, I feel differently about a future Walker Bueller start than I did um, going in. And what that what that does, first of all, like to 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 your point about what he was doing in that 90 pitch burst. Like this is a dude who has absolutely had to figure out how to knock the rust off of what he's feeling 
first and foremost. So there's where I think you can attribute, you know, any, any sort of command issues or just overall rust, lackluster performance in general. Let's take that where he's at physically. And now let's factor in the adrenaline and the responsibility that comes along with making starts in October. And now you have a heightened sense of awareness when it comes to taking care of the baseball specifically. He's not trying to leave shit middle. He is absolutely going to be stepping on the gas with two strikes. And he probably does that because he knows if I'm going to, if I'm going to be unleashed here, I don't know if it benefits me or I don't know if it benefits the team trying to pace myself through this outing here, because ultimately should I be pacing myself and I'm in a pretty good pitch count situation come the sixth inning, seventh inning, I'm probably getting lifted anyway, even if I make it that far simply because of the arms and the matchups that I have waiting down there in the bullpen to help me out. So if you're Walker Bueller and you're Dave Roberts and you're Mark Pryor and you're the rest of the arms that have been having this conversation with him, you're telling him, you go out there and you let this motherfucker eat. Because when you do and when you're done, we've got boys to come in and clean it up behind you. And this is why we were looking at this Dodger staff. And this is why I've highlighted the Dodger staff. Everybody has. You have an entire staff worth of arms on the fucking injured list, man. If you get any one of these dudes that you have pitching for you right now, to show up and perform in a fashion in which you could have expected or anticipated them if they're healthy, that is a major, major addition to this series. So enter Walker Bueller, who looked like in those four innings, he was about as good as you could have hoped for. And that was, without a doubt, the difference in this game. We've been talking about which team can account for 15 outs from their starting pitcher. And while it was only 12 from Walker Bueller, you have the firepower that you have down there in that bullpen that made that decision easy. You give us four goose eggs, we'll go find another five down there in the bullpen, no problem. I think the two most interesting things to come out of the post game last night uh, first was listening to Walker Bueller talk about how he's like, man, I j- I'm just happy I didn't, I didn't suck. Uh, I didn't even know if I was going to make the roster. Now, here I am putting the Dodgers up 2-1, two wins away from the World Series. Um, It was interesting kind of to hear his, uh, like where he was mentally coming into the NLCS. I mean, this was a dude that was pitching innings in the World Series for the Dodgers. Uh, A guy that was looked at as the heir to Kershaw's throne as, as the number one in L.A., sitting there wondering, am I even going to make the roster? Um, and then the other thing that I found interesting in the post game was when Kike was talking to he, he actually. Uh, did you see this, Dallas? No. Uh, so Kike, like if you're if you're watching on TV, it's Kevin Burkhart, it's A-Rod, Kike, Poppy, and then Jeter. And A-Rod was like, and you know, Kike, like if you know Kike, he'll be a prick to your face, but he'll do it in a way where like he has plausible deniability that he didn't mean it like that, <laughs> but he does. Um, so A-Rod asks Kike, he's like, man, you know, like you, 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 you turn it on in the postseason and, you know, your average number of at bats per home run, it's it's right up there with some of the greats of all time. Like, how do you do it? And he's saying like A-Rod is sitting to his right and Poppy and Jeter are sitting to his left. And he's like, man, you know, just, you know, the guys to my left over here, they know what it's like to perform in the postseason. And it's like, (laughs) he just fucking. (laughs) I need this right uh, now. I need to see this right now yeah i'll i'll try and find it but yeah he he was like yeah he's like you know the guys on my left like they know man it's just different when to succeed in the playoffs like that (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but he made he made another (laughs) that was funny oh um what was Ray Rod's reaction? He just smiled. He was like, <laughs> yeah, like he, you know, <laughs> oh, he's, he's got to play it out. He's never going to get mad. Like he's too goofy. Um, but the other thing that Kike said, because I think Poppy asked him about the shutouts and he was like, you know, you guys are super talented, but <clears throat> you guys aren't giving up any runs. Like what's what's the difference? Like what's the difference between this team and, and the other Dodger playoff teams? And Kike was talking about how 
Um, like, yeah, like we have a like in the past, we've had talented pitchers. But what we have this year is a bunch of talented pitchers, but all their stuff is different. So it was almost like in years past, like, yeah, we had a bunch of talented guys, but their stuff was so similar that when you change pitchers, it's like, all right, are you really changing pitchers here? It's a it's a different name. It's a different social security number, but it's it's virtually the same look. And with this group of guys that the Dodgers have coming out of the bullpen this year, it's like, yeah, we have a bunch of talented relievers, um, but it's it's none of it looks the same. Like you're just you're getting different shit every time you're up there. Well, that's that's something that the Tampa Bay Rays coined uh, a long time ago. And when you talk about arms on a clock, and this is something that you have to pay attention to. This is something that I have stressed for a very long time is one pitch presentation. And that's what these baseballs, quite literally, what does the baseball look like to your opponent? And if you are running a 6'3 right-hander out there who has a very similar arm slot with a similar pitch mix, fastball slider, you you know, and, and we're in the same velocity phrase or, or, or velocity areas, what are we doing? What are we changing here outside of a jersey number? You know, and that's where the Rays said, if you're going to see somebody different than the starter in the sixth inning. It's going to be from a completely different arm slot than you saw from the starter, and it's going to be a different pitch mix. And then when we see you again in the eighth inning, maybe the ninth inning, you might be seeing a guy throwing with a completely different hand from a completely different arm slot just because you're not going to see the same shit twice in the game today. It's just not going to happen. And you think about you know guys like Banda, Vasia, Vasia who's not on the roster, uh, th- this time around, but the, the, just their stuff and what it looks like knack and what it looks like. And then you think about running a guy like Blake Trinan out there with his fucking super sanker and that sweeper is shit is just going in all sorts of different directions. Like it, it's a, it's a tactful approach on how to make sure that your opponent can never adjust and is never comfortable. Just, just, just simply can't game plan. They have, they have the six pitches that you get to throw in between innings or the eight, whatever, when you, when you're coming in, they've got that time to prepare for you. That's what you'd like to keep it at is you can look at the book and you can have the conversation, but I don't want you to have the ability to go back in your physical Rolodex to an at bat that you just had yesterday against the same dude. Don't want that to happen. Mm. Well, it's two, one Doyers show. Hey, uh, people calling him low leverage show. Hey, I don't like that. I don't like that. Come on, come on. That's just on. that. That that's just haters. Shohei's got haters. That's all it. Yeah, bunch of hating yeah, ass. Hey, hey. Baseball. He's just fans. saying, look, dude, you're you're bitching about me not getting knocks when guys are on base. I'm just waiting for someone to be on base so that when I do get the knocks, they matter. That's all. Yeah. So he's he's really letting the game come to him, and mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's spitting in the face of what your prototypical leadoff guy is. He's like, look, if, I, if I'm on base, that's fantastic. There's other guys that can drive me in, sure. But we know what I'm here to do. And that's that's to put numbers on the board. So put put guys on base. I'll put numbers on the board. Yeah. Game four is tonight. The uh, Dodgers and Mets have the primetime spot. It's an 8.08 p.m. Eastern start time. And it will be Yamamoto versus Quintana. I love, I love this matchup. I was going to say I like it. I changed it to love mid-sentence. I love it. I love this matchup. It's two dudes um, where Quintana may not have the namesake that he used to have, and he never really did have like superstar namesake, but there was a point in time where it was like Sale and Quintana. Like those were the fucking dudes in Chicago. Um, but Quintana's been throwing the piss out of the ball for a while now. Uh, Yamamoto, they paid him a lot of money for a start like this. So how do we feel about game four between the Dodgers and Mets tonight in Queens? Game four for Yamamoto. Mm-hmm. Mm. I mean, I feel like this is what you, I mean, you said it. This is what you got paid for. This is what you got breaded up for. Three time. Salamora Award winner. Time to show up and show out. This is the stage. Let's get it done. Coming off a pretty decent outing last time around. No? Pretty good. Five shut. 
Where are you taking this? I think it's going to be a tight one. I know we've we've just been seeing like a a, a volley of ass beatings so far. I think Yamamoto fucking deals, Jared. You do deals. You do deals. What does that look deals. like, though? I I think we get Is that six. I was going to say I'd like to see him into the seventh. And and again, the only thing that gives me pause about saying that is just Pitch because count. I know the Dodgers are. Well, no, no, no. I know the Dodgers are, are ready to fucking unload in the bullpen. I know they're ready to to bring guys in. Yeah. I think the score, and I think it's a lazy response to tell you that the score could dictate that, but I think it's fair to say that if the Dodgers have a four-run lead going into the sixth or seventh inning and Yamamoto, Yamamoto's pitch count is within line, I mean, it might be a matter of, all right, if we get a few runners on, if we get some traffic, we start to make moves, make decisions, but I think this could very well be a Yamamoto coming out party. Is this a 4-2 ball game, Dallas? Does it smell like 4-2? <sighs> Um, I, I, again, I want to say, no, it, no, it doesn't. Mm. I, I think if Yamamoto can come out and establish, establish himself early, I think that's going to do as much for the offense as it will for Yamamoto and himself, because it tells them they have no shot over there with what we're seeing unfold. So let's just put the at-bats together. Let's get on the board. Let's create so this. this is let's a five, this, this is a five, one ball game. You're saying could be smells like five, one Dodgers to you. I think it's going to be similar to a, I could see five, one, six, two. I think it's going to be similar to a blowout or closer to a blowout than it will to a tightly contested ball. Oh, okay. Justin Havens. What's your, what's your read on this game? My read on this is actually has to do with the other side, uh, not Yamamoto. It has to do with Quintana <clears throat> uh, and how he matches up against the Dodgers offense. And while I respect that Jose Quintana has a zero five, seven ERA over his last eight starts, um, his number one pitch is the sinker. He throws it 30% of the time. And unfortunately, uh, there are very few teams in baseball that are as good at hitting sinkers as the Los Angeles Dodgers. They rank, you pick a stat, they rank second in Major League Baseball, basically to the Yankees uh, in any of those. Home runs against sinkers, batting average, slugging percentage, WOBA, doesn't really matter. Uh, that's playoffs and regular season. So, um Certainly, obviously, we know that anything could happen, but I, I think this is uh, a game that uh, the, can, the run of Quintana's strong pitching uh, meets uh, an unfortunate weakness for him. Wow. Wow. And as a man who called Dodgers in five, um, you know, that's the, the script is playing out as I thought it would, and it will continue tonight. Yeah, that's kind of fucked mm. up. Is what it is, man. Judge and Soto are the best, two best hitters in baseball on sinkers. That's crazy. Judge against sinkers hits 381 with a 1261 OPS. Soto 347 with an 1195 OPS. That's outrageous. <laughs> it, it almost feels like pitchers are like, you know what? <clears throat> we can't throw the regular sinker to Judge because it will sink below his kneecaps and it won't be a strike. So I have to elevate my sinker to get it to a point where it will actually be called a strike against this fucking guy. And maybe that's too high. And maybe Aaron judge is fucking feasting on guys trying to throw him sinkers that are ultimately like probably closer to mid thigh high, maybe even waist high yeah. to other guys where these are fucking, <laughs> he's like, buddy, keep trying to lay it in there. I'm going to keep fucking whacking it. Yeah. Yeah. Sinkers are not working for some of the more premier hitters in baseball, like Brent Rooker, 339 with a 1034 OPS against sinkers. Shohei Otani, 315 with a 1013 OPS against sinkers. Bobby Witt Jr., 336 with a 1034 OPS against sinkers. Jordan Alvarez, 332 with a 1013 OPS against sinkers. I'd be curious to know the average velocity on the sinkers that the guys are facing. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, be, well, just, just because, and this is where my brain goes. I started to think about movement and talking about guys with elite hand eye, elite bat to ball. Yeah. And now is there something to taking away the movement that they're allowed to play for or that they do a good job of playing for? And now what if we put a couple more ticks of velo behind that? I wonder if I can find that out. 
will you just start to go to like fastballs 95 or greater? Oh, I could do that. Yeah, let's do that. And my guess would be that the success against those pitches are is less than the success across the board on the sinker <laughs> for some of those guys. Uh, it's still Juan Soto and Judge. Juan Soto on sinkers 95 or harder, 350 with an 1175 OPS. Judge, 370 with an 1133 OPS. They're still one and two in baseball. What are those? Uh, um, Rafael Devers those then enters the equation with an 1113 OPS as the third best. On the, on the sinkers at 95 or greater? Yes. Gotcha. And then where are the other guys that you mentioned? Otani, Rooker? Uh, Rooker's four. 1106 OPS. Wit is six. Uh, 1005 OPS. Um, I see. I I love. I love to hear that because I that's showing that these guys, whether it's velocity or velocity coupled with movement, yeah, they're still able to get to the baseball. Yep, they're still on time. Sure, and that is what's so important about hitting. And you'll hear it from each and every one of those dudes. You'll hear it from anybody who hits in the game. Timing, 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 timing. And what don't you ever want to get off? I don't ever want to be off the fastball. I do not want to be off the fastball. If I'm off the fastball, I can't hit anything else. Yeah. I'm guessing and I'm looking for one thing that's typically in one spot. And that means I'm beat by everything else. Yeah. So whether you're sinking it or whether you're four seaming it, these boys are going to get to it. The only other guy that has a OPS of a thousand or better against sinkers 95 and harder is Kyle Schwarber, 1047. See, and then I'd be interested to dive into the uh, dive into the um, approach angle of each of these guys. Bat path, mm. average launch angle, because now we're talking about I'm trying to move. Anyway, that's that's scouting. That's that's, that's top tier shit there now. Yeah. Well, yeah. now that Jared's equipped all the listeners with this deep dive information, it would be a good time to go download the Underdog Fantasy app. Up to a thousand dollars in bonus cash and a special pick today. Mm-hmm. You know what's happening. What's the special pick today? Well, it's a check your treat situation mm. where uh, you log in and you see what little uh, treats you've been given for Dallas Boostober. Dallas logging in. Oh, big login guy. Got stuff coming on Friday, Saturday, it's, and Sunday, too, for Boostober. Boostober fun. doesn't end until October ends, presumably. Promo code Jared. Promo code Jared. Log in. I'm attracted to a lot of different guys. As uncalled for. I mean, you did you not say that? My words for sure. My yeah, words. I mean, I'd fly my guy down here to do me sometimes. <laughs> I know what I want <laughs> and I know where to get it. <laughs> uh, That's right. <clears throat> The BID listeners have got me searching up some better help. They've been really, they've been really pissing me off lately. <laughs> they've been really pissing What's me wrong? off. Because I feel like our community, right? Like when I tweet things out, I expect dumb people. I expect my banter to reach dumb people. That's just the internet. But if you're a listener of this show, then it's like you are, you, you get it. You're on the inside. The number of people that just don't get what's going on here, they're like, when is this guy going to put aside his Yankee bias? Never. 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 He's ruining. The, there are actual people that were saying that they want me removed from this show. They're like, the show would be so much better without Jared. I'm like, because because of my Yankee bias. And I'm like, I'm a Red Sox fan. If you want serious baseball, like go to MLB Network. They're they're great over there. They can break it down. And even Jay Hay, Dallas, they're great at breaking it down. Baseball is dead as entertainment. We are baseball entertainment. We have it all. We have the inside jokes, we've got the nugs, we've got the former player perspective, we've got the fan perspective, we've got the weird brain perspective when Joe's here. We've got all the angles. But one thing I can assure you, you will always get from me, 
is I don't like the Yankees. I don't like them. I'm a Red Sox fan. I feel like that's okay. I feel like it should be okay. Uh, and if it's not, that's why I need to go to better help. I'm going to I'm going to vent to them. I'm going to be like, I do this podcast. The people that listen to it want me off of it. They think it'll be better if I'm not here anymore. Uh, you see the Red Sox and Yankees are longtime rivals and, uh, I'm a Red Sox fan, so I, I'm just programmed to not like the Yankees. But for some reason, they think that me not liking the Yankees is ruining the show. So I'm, I'm going to vent to a therapist about this. It's the only it's the only choice I have at this point. I it, I don't know what else to do. I don't know where else to turn. Because October is a season for wearing masks and costumes. But some of us feel like we wear a mask and hide more often than we want to at work and social settings around our family. Therapy can be a place that you learn to accept all parts of yourself so you can take off the mask because masks should be for Halloween fun, not for our emotions. The audience is asking me to wear a mask. They're saying, you know what? Put on, put on that Aaron Judge, George Steinbrenner, Bernie Williams mask and just Call it down the middle. Just, just be a Yankee Bobo. Just do that. Just, just spit in the face of your morals and your values and everything you've ever stood for. Undo the years, the decades of work that you've strived to achieve. The brand that you've built. The audience that you've garnered. Spit on it. Piss on all of it for the sake of the Yankees being in the ALCS. And by the way, I picked them to sweep. I'm the only person that believes in this fucking team. It's crazy to me. But that's why BetterHelp is here to help me through this trying time where I'm just a confused baseball fan is what I am. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash B-I-D today. Excuse me, BetterHelp.com slash baseball. It's baseball. Visit BetterHelp.com slash baseball today to get 10% 10% off your first month. That is BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash baseball. Quick, quick little sidebar on the, the accusations that this podcast can't handle Yankees content mm-hmm. appropriately with you at the masthead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just reject that wholeheartedly because I think if you look at a lot of the kind of like biggest topics that have popped up over Yankeedom over the last, let's just call it calendar year Mm -hmm. i actually think this podcast has uh has been extremely fair and level-headed with most of those things if you'll recall there was a good portion of last season where everybody involving the yankees thought that the fucking world was ending and that what is 2024 going to bring are they even going to be back in contention for the al east ah and it was this podcast not everyone universally but this podcast that at least debated the topic and i think i came down on the side of that the Yankees were very much going to be back in 2024 and that this is always something that happens. Secondarily, this fire Aaron Boone stuff that happens basically yeah, every season. They're now 2-0 and in the ALCS, two wins away from the World Series. That would have that all seems very childish in hindsight. And the Aaron Judge stuff. Like, I I'm sure lots of podcasts were touting Aaron Judge's season as it was happening. We have been all over the historical context and significance and greatness of what Aaron Judge has been doing all season long since it started, and we've been covering it regularly. So I just, yes, yes, you are a Red Sox fan, and anyone who tunes into this podcast expecting you to be anything else, I think, is being intentionally obtuse. Mm. Um, But there is lots of other Yankee conversation that happens here that if you can just chill out for a second, I think is very worthwhile. So. Maybe that's uh, misplaced frustration, but I feel like could be we've been all over um, the tentpole topics with the Yankees. Mm-hmm. I think as far as uh, the show being better, if I'm not on it, I just want to say I disagree. I disagree too. Yeah, just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't want it to be implied. I want it to be explicitly stated. Yeah. I prefer this show when you're here. Yeah. Please note that Dallas has <laughs> not commented. No, he hasn't. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, yeah, I, I couldn't couldn't do it without you guys. I think the listeners, if they gave a listen to a me, Dallas, and Joey podcast in the off season, would be <laughs> very stressed could, out. I think it, I, <laughs> by the end of it, I think that would be chaotic. I, I think it would be. Um, I think it'd be good. I, I think it would be a funny one off. I like to yeah. yank on him. Mm -hmm. That's Joey. Yeah, he's so talking about or. Um, I'm not sure. We don't know. Yeah. 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 My <laughs> yeah. soundboard <laughs> fire. Tell you that. <clears throat> uh, the Yankees won again. Um, I even said, I said, I said on section 10 last night, I was like, some of my takes that have just all been correct. I can't even tweet them anymore because they upset people for how correct I am where I, I have to just send them to the group text. And I said, uh, forget about winning a game. The Guardians may not have a lead in this series. And to this point, they have not. They have not led at any point in this series. It is very one-sided. Can I ask you something? Yes, please. Just as we're an entertainment podcast and just mm -hmm. kind of riffing here. Mm -hmm. uh, why... What is it about the Guardians mm -hmm. in the ALCS mm -hmm. that makes them so woefully underqualified to participate in this round, whereas you don't seem to feel that way about a Mets team mm -hmm. that came in with a worse record mm -hmm. um, and is thus far been outscored. The margin of victory mm -hmm. actually is greater for the Dodgers so far, run, run differential, than it is for the Yankees. What is it about, like, why, why don't you see the Mets as kind of an outlier in terms of quality of team? Um, I do, but oh, okay. I just, I take it more personally. Right. Oh, okay. Because I, I, I want the Yankees to lose. Right. I feel and, like that's a part of this that people aren't picking up on. Yeah. Like, I, I wanted the Padres to advance because I felt like that would have been or the Padres and um, who the fuck did the Mets beat? Phils. Yeah. Phillies. Yeah. Like the Phillies. I, I We all picked the Phillies. It's like, yeah, like we like the Mets. It's a fun story. But as far as what would be the better matchup, I think it would have been like the Phillies would pose a larger threat on that side of the bracket. But it is what it is. You know, it is I, what it is. It is what it is. I think um, at least with the Dodgers path to the World Series, they had to go through the Padres. Like that's a very difficult matchup. Like they earned their spot in the AL the NLCS. Whereas the Yankees have will go virtually untouched en route to the World Series. So what okay. So not to belabor this, we can move on after it's this. It's not even but, the Yankees' fault. But but what is it that separates the Padres from the Guardians? They were separated by an actual half game during the regular season. That's because the Guardians didn't get to play their last game. 92 and 69 and 93 and 69. I feel like we're drawing lines between quality of teams that don't exist. Uh, they just have more stars. I mean, I like their, their, they have actual starting pitchers that can take the ball. Yeah, whereas... that's, that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest separator of all is you start at the starting pitching. Yeah. From there, I don't know how much more room you have to argue. But that seems to be the most obvious and the glaring separator. So outside of that, they have guys that, who can take the ball. That's what was my response like when you because Jared said in the group chat, uh, what do you say? Like, I feel like the A's would have would have given off uh, given a better fight. Yeah. And I said and I responded with what well, we have identifiable starting pitching. And whether you like the starting i, I or just not? feel like that's an aesthetic thing that's not like a quality of team thing that's that's like because like we're, we're talking about teams that were functionally the exact same during the regular season one of those teams is now in the alcs one of those teams lost in the ds and we're saying because one faction of the padres is superior to the guardians that they are somehow a different quality of team and more deserving of participating in the postseason I just don't. Well, it's just I, quality I think, in a different spot. I'm not. I'm not the one I, arguing with you. It's quality I, I, in a different I just spot. Feel the Guardians like, have a bullpen. The Padres have a rotation. I'm not. I, all right, so it's, let me rephrase because I don't. I, I didn't. It's not that the Guardians aren't worthy of their spot. They won 
the necessary games to get there. I'm just saying if the Yankees played the Padres in the ALCS, people are jacked up about that matchup because of the stars and the potential, like the offenses going head to head. No one is excited about Cleveland's offense, and we're seeing why. They can't fucking score runs, especially sure, when right? Jose Ramirez is going the way that he's going. Like, if he's I, not on fire, then what are the... Go- like, we're, we're waiting for fucking if, Lane Thomas to hit a home run? If this is just being reduced to, I like star power, then that's fine. I also agree with that, and I would also be more excited for a series featuring more star power uh, in a Yankees ALCS. But I just feel like the narrative on on Cleveland specifically has kind of run amok here because I I feel like you could put any team that participated in the AL and was near the postseason in the spot that the Guardians are in right now and quality of team wise it would feel similar like if the Royals were here if the Tigers were here if Mm -hmm. the Orioles were here I think they would all be similarly not the Orioles mismatched I just disagree I I know you're on this Orioles thing but there's just the Orioles wouldn't the AL there would be a a parody driven feel to it though the Orioles were a very average team. They're like the opposite of the Mets, basically. They just had more guys that maybe you thought should be doing things right, that worked. worked. That, that, well, that's the whole point, is they were, they were not. And just because I think, I think for Jared, it's a comfort thing. Like you have, you have all of the young stars. You have all of the young players that are supposed to be a part of this mix for the foreseeable future. They're here now. And what were you getting from them? Nothing. Down the stretch, it was dismal. I, they had, for a 10-minute period, started to turn things around, but really had just limped in to the latter part of the season and the postseason. Limped in. They won 7-10 to 10 down the stretch. I just think we're, we're seeing the result of everything we talked about during the regular season, which is that there's an enormous amount of parity. No team won 100 games. There was no all-time great team during the regular season on paper as it played out this year. And if you're not going to create an environment where you have multiple juggernaut teams, which we've seen as recently as like five, four, three or four or five years ago, where you've got the potential for 100 win teams to meet in the LCS, if that's not the sort of playoff environment that Major League Baseball is cultivating and it's clearly not their intention, I think we're just going to get this kind of stuff, which is where like you know, a team that could be argued as the second best team in the AL all the way down to like the sixth or seventh best team in the AL is going to be in the ALCS or the NLCS in any given season. Like nobody can convince me that the Diamondbacks are appreciably better than either of the weaker teams that we see in the LCS this year, Mets or Guardians. It's just they went to the World Series and kind of sort of almost won it. So it's like, uh, okay, we view them differently in hindsight. I just this is the new era. And it just so happens that these LCSs actually do feature maybe the two most talented teams in the Dodgers and the Yankees. And instead of a matchup of four teams total, that are all just kind of like these 91, 92 win kind of eh, parody driven successes. And ultimately, that's why that's why you hear the stress from the dugout about playing the proper brand of baseball, a good brand of baseball at the right time, which is right now, because. If you are a team in the Cleveland Guardians who are underdogs, who are undermatched, but you have a guy like Lane Thomas show up and get the knock, you you need more than that from Lane, but the team could roll if Lane Thomas, at the right time, has one of the better weeks of his professional career, right? It just so happens that that week comes in October, and now you're able to rely on that production that you didn't see coming in May, June. July, uh, you just you weren't expecting it. Now you're getting it from an unexpected area with a level of consistency that actually matters. Like whether or not Lane Thomas is the guy on your wall, whether or not Lane Thomas is the guy that you're personally collecting in your autographs and your baseball cards, that that doesn't matter. If Lane Thomas for 10 days can put his swing together and roll, he becomes somebody that this team did not anticipate producing, but becomes somebody that this team is relying upon. And the problem is, is it was one swing from Lane and there hasn't been many other swings from anybody else around him. And that's, I, that's why the question mark is what it is offensively because you're not getting anything from anybody. I mean, Stephen Kwan, right? We're like, we're, we're, we're getting super excited about the way that Stephen Kwan is filleting the baseball 
over to the left side of the infield and getting on base. Okay, but what comes after that? I, I'm not disputing that this, this Guardians offense is insufficient for the moment. Um, and I think we, we have saw that coming, you know, going all the way back to the Chris Rose interview where he called out a lot of this stuff. But like, um, I just feel like the league has cultivated a situation where imperfect teams are going to pop up in the LCS basically every season. And Cleveland's imperfectness uh, is manifesting in multiple areas right now because the rotation is so depleted and the offense stinks. Um, but I just don't know that in, in five years when we review this conversation, I just feel like Cleveland's participation is going to be more like th that year's example as opposed to a, a historical outlier of, of overmatched quality and, or something. And shouldn't we, shouldn't we find a place to settle on where we accept this, where we're okay with this, because this is how it's drawn up. This is quite literally how it's drawn up. Yes. Right. So, so get excited. And, and this is part of what I admitted my trust tree openness at the beginning of the season. When I said, you know what? I don't like the fact that the playoff picture has been built and shaped the way it is, but I would be lying to you if I told you that just glancing over the standings and where you're at in July and August now carries a little more weight to it simply because the picture is a little broader. And if you're going to pay attention, you have to factor in more teams. I, and, and I think that's something that you should start to celebrate and get excited about whether or not you're happy about it. Cause I was not happy about it. Hand up. I fucking hate the idea of an 85 win team being in the dance. I fucking hate it. But if that 85 win team is going to put their shit together and compete against juggernauts, 95 plus win teams, and show that they can win and compete over a series, over two series, over three series, well, then who am I to tell you that that 85-win team, who at the most important time of the season showed up and won, isn't deserving of a championship? And, and that's fine. Uh, we can be accepting of that, but we can also be, to Jared's point, we can also be frustrated because as much as I would like to defend the Guardians' participation in this round of the postseason, the actual ALCS through two games has not been very entertaining and it has not produced a high level, a high quality of baseball on one side. So that there is a you can be accepting of the broad structure, but to be but to be frustrated with this matchup explicitly and the lack of entertainment value that it is providing is to me totally fair. And I'm with him on that. I'm with Jared there. I would, no, I would no, love that. I no wish this was a better series. I wish that even if the Guardians weren't winning games, I wish the games felt tighter than they are. And I said that the margins haven't been that great, and that's true, but they also haven't been tense games. They like Cleveland's basically been down from the start and how they got down in game two well, was like in, you know, in cl uh, clown the, car the, fashion. So yeah, it's like, the oh, quality, the, moments, the quality of play is sucked on both sides. Like, it, like well, both the, sides, the big moments are pitching changes in the second and third inning. That's the big moments of the game. Yeah, and judge hitting a home run to go up six when it's like, dude, we already had a lead. Thanks. Like, you know, but yeah, like the, the, the series has lacked moments. It's lacked quality baseball. It's lacked uh, drama, um, anything, you know, I, it's like, I know people will just be, oh, you're just hating on it because it's the Yankees. If it was the Guardians and Royals, I'd be sitting here saying the same thing. Like the quality of baseball sucks and the like I understand you get to play games. Someone's going to win. Someone's going to lose. And not every game is going to be super entertaining. And that was the other point that I was going to make was I think a lot of it or part of it is the bar was set so high in the wild card and division rounds where every game was like, holy fuck, what happened? And then we get to the LCS and it's kind of just like, all right. In the NLCS, it's just teams blowing each other out. And in the ALCS, it's just a monkey fucking a football. It's not good well, baseball, no, and it's the team no that's supposed blood. to win is winning. And whoop de doo I, it, it, does, it does augur the promise, though, of an incredible capper uh, in the World Series. Because I think if we, if we get to a point where let's, Mets, Mets Yankees or Dodgers Yankees, if that's what we get, and it's anywhere as good as people, as the hype will lead us to believe, then we're looking at an all-time level postseason, I think. Because if you look at, if you've got like a solid wild card round, an outstanding DS, and a great World Series, there aren't many years, if you go back and look, where all four rounds of the postseason were just knock me on my ass. 
Um, no, and and how do you not? How do you look at a Judge Otani series and think that there's any more star power out there to be had? Oh, there's juice. Like there's like as far, as far as that goes, right there. That's why I build it with the Bobby Witt Jr. and Aaron Judge. You know, back and forth. What what kind of spectacle that could have been? Well, you're talking about a guy who a lot of folks, myself included, believe he was robbed of an MVP due to the season of the other fella. And now you're going to see those dudes square off. I I just don't think you can overstate how it, it is a, it could be a defining world series as it relates to this generation of fandom and growing the game and stuff like that. Like you just, people are like, Oh, Yankees, Dodgers, like, give me a break. These just, they don't happen. They don't happen. It's not like the When's NBA. When's the last time we got Yankees Dodgers? It's not like the NBA where you get like, you know, where the Cavs and, and Warriors ran up against each other <laughs> for four straight seasons or whatever. And then you have the 80s dynastic clashes and stuff like that. It's you, you don't get the big market five. teams squaring off in, in five, five, what? Five MVPs. Oh, yeah. You're going to have five MVPs in this series, right? Soto hasn't won it, but he is one. You're going to have what's that? He is one. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to have five MVPs competing against each other in a potential World Series matchup. Again, three of them on the same team. The first three hitters that the Yankee pitching staff will face. That's just that that is that's a galaxy of stars. Fuck star power. That's a galaxy of stars. Dallas, what year were you born? 83. Okay, 83. so nobody on this podcast has been alive to see a Yankees Dodgers world. That's what I'm saying. Like, when you were saying, oh, Yankees Dodgers, blah, blah, blah. It's like, if you're 70, you can say that. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, this matchup again. But anyone outside, like, who who has seen, yet? when's the last time it happened, Jay? 81. 81. Okay. And if, you know, if you were alive at that time, that was also a year that was a shortened season. So, I'm sure at the time there were lots of at, there was lots of asterisk talk uh, back then. So in a full season, last time they did it was 78. Um, so every basically what 95 percent of the people listening to this podcast have never seen a Yankees Dodgers World Series, and it Probably would be potential. It would be potentially happening at a time when um, literally the two the game's two biggest stars unequivocally play for those teams. I mean it's. It, you really can't overstate the level of good that it could do uh, for the game as a whole to get those two oh. on the biggest stage. And I know we're several games away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, four total wins by those teams, but um, Mets fans not happy with this segment. No. Well, you know, yeah, Mets fans, a lot of grimacing going on right now. Oh, wow. Wow. Ooh, going I, low there. Um, Dallas, you got to go. What's your fucking final thought here? Got to go. Um, Final thought is I would like, I want to see a Yamamoto deal fest. I want to see a Yamamoto deal fest. I think he is poised for it. I think our tournament is poised for it. Um, I think it would do a lot of good for the, for the energy to watch a tightly contested, well-pitched ball game dominance from Yamamoto. I'm going to give him i uh, I'll go six and two thirds, nine punchies. Nine punchies. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's that's aggressive. That's aggressive, but I'm going there. It's yeah, it's aggressive, but it could happen. Um, all right, Dallas. We'll see you. Yeah. When are we recording again, Jake? Sunday? Saturday? Uh, we loosely discuss Saturday, but we'll let everybody know. Uh, yeah. You know, cheer dad. Cheer dad's holding up the whole fucking process over here. <laughs> Who you? You're 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 cheer dad. Cheer dad. I'm volunteer dad. And I'm I was talking about myself. Cheer dad, Jerry. Okay. Yeah. Fucking cheer dad. Cheer dad, Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. Update me on Jerry the gerbil too. Here you go. Bye. Um, all right. Justin Havens. Yes, sir. Do we have some nugs? By any we chance? do. Oh, yes. Definitely. Tell me. Tell me that you have a nug about Matthew Boyd. Oh, we'll get to him towards the end. How's okay. that sound? All right. Um, some stuff to recap last night's game. Uh, Walker Bueller is the second pitcher with a start of exactly four innings pitched and zero runs allowed in a league championship series, joining Ian Anderson from game two 
of the 2020 NLCS. So Ian Anderson, one of those guys with an amazing uh, postseason resume who just seemingly fell off the planet, um, obviously due to injury, not not blaming him for it. Um, the continuing on Walker Bueller again and Luis Severino, neither of them allowed an earned run last night. It's the first instance of both starting pitchers not allowing an earned run while also failing to make it to five innings pitched in the same postseason start since game three of the 2016 World Series. That was Kyle Hendricks and Josh Tomlin. Uh, Kike Hernandez tied Babe Ruth and Jason Wirth for 18th on the all-time postseason home run list with 15. Thank you to all of the trusted uh, followers who pointed out that Babe Ruth's all came in the World Series. I didn't know that beforehand. Thank you for telling me. Um, Dodgers batters with multiple three-run homers in a single postseason, which Otani now has uh, after last night. It's Otani, Yasiel Puig in 2018, and Justin Turner in 2017. Um, I did a little uh, impromptu graphic building last night, a little graphic design is my passion work, uh, comparing Kike Hernandez and Aaron Judge's postseason careers. Would you believe that they have almost the exact same number of plate appearances, 223 for Kike? And 224 for Judge. It's not going to Kike well has more homers and more RBI. Yeah, I believe that. I do believe that. Yeah. About 150 points of OPS difference, too. So wow. we'll see whether Judge can close the gap with Kike. I mean, you know, tough to blame him. All time great like Kike Hernandez. Um, the uh, three run homers went up four to nothing in the game postseason history. We got real specific last night. Um, Otani last night, Rich Aurelia in mm. game four of the 2002 NLDS. So that was the first time that had happened in 22 years. I know we were all celebrating that. 1999 ALDS game one, Bernie Williams, your boy Jim Rice yeah. in game seven of the 1986 ALCS, and Jim Bagby in the 1920 World Series. Jimmy B. Game five. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Jimmy B. Um, I'll remember they, they called it, his nickname was. Bagby. Bagby. It's interesting because that's his name. Right. But, you know, they just they just threw the, the E on the end. Mm -hmm. and just had his name again. Mm -hmm. um, as I alluded to earlier, the Dodgers are the first team ever to have three shutouts of eight nothing or greater in the same postseason, uh, which they have done in NLDS game four, NLCS game one and NLCS game three. The 96 Braves and the 1960 Yankees are the only other teams that have even two such games in a single postseason. Uh, four shutouts in a five game span, which the Dodgers have now also done. Uh, that's the 24 Dodgers, the 2020 Braves and the 1905 Giants. Um, and Matt Boyd, I got some bad news. This isn't ah. a terribly complicated nug, but I do think it's revealing uh, about my, at least my expectations for tonight. Uh, Matt Boyd has a 5.17 ERA for his career in uh, six career starts against the Yankees, unfortunately. Ooh. And the double bad news is that over his last four starts, he's allowed six home runs. He's allowed um, two home runs in 2018, two home runs in 2019, and he allowed two home runs in his lone start against the Yankees this year. Uh, five and a third, four hits, three runs, two homers, four walks, and two strikeouts. Uh, that's eight base runners and five and a third. That's along the lines of what I'm expecting tonight, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, when Who you hit the homers, though, are they still even on the team if this goes back to 2018? Let's. Oh, well, let's see. Let's. You know what? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at uh, Boyd's if Brett success Gardner against is hitting current home runs Yankee batters against against Matthew Boyd. I don't know that that matters to me tonight. No, I think that's a uh, that's a very fair point. Let's take a look. Boyd yeah. against the Yankees. Marcus Thames is hitting home runs. All right. So we've got mm, really bad news, but uh, it's all Judge and Stanton. <sighs> the two homers this season were by Judge and Soto. Ah. So I feel like they're still on the still playing central roles for the 2024 mm -hmm. Yankees. Um yeah. Aaron Judge also <laughs> Jesus Christ. Aaron Judge also has five walks. In eleven plate appearances, pretty good. He's got a good eye, that guy. Against Aaron. Boyd, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay. So not great. Um. Anyway, those are the nugs, and uh, good luck to the guards tonight. 
Um, Jake Stakes? Uh, just one more shout out to Dave Roberts for stealing that bag, man. That was fucking huge. Huge. Tremendous. Thank you, Dave Roberts. Uh, we're back on Saturday, working out the time. But uh, you will have a podcast this weekend to be, what, the third of the week? Well, it depends. Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday would technically be four. Four? Like. Four in the same week? Wow. Which hopefully I believe. That makes us for, hopefully that makes up for us uh, live streaming that one podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I believe four in a week actually only counts as one. Um, yeah. On the, if on the, carry the if, Yeah. Yep. If you carry the two. Just one pod. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One. One. Yep. All right. We will be back on Saturday. Uh, enjoy the double header tonight. This is, uh, this is, could be one of the last that we get until next year. We, one of the last times we have two games in the same day. Wow. That's dramatic. Yeah. It's very, uh, it's sad. I think it's the second to last day. Okay. Cause we're guaranteed. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, today is two games tomorrow is guaranteed to be two games friday yeah and then monday saturday would be if alcs necessary. game five right yep and saturday and sunday are standalone games uh monday would be alcs game six and nlcs game seven together yeah if necessary that's why i made plans to go to the movies on saturday night because game five won't be necessary Incredibly rude. We gone!